king whom he may devour, and the ones that he devours are the ones that leave the door open and give him an opportunity. Let's just quickly go through the slides of what we saw last week. Let me get it out of the way. We said that first of all, and I always emphasize this, that he who's in us, which is Jesus, yes. is far greater, Amen. far more powerful that's right. than the one that's in the world, that's the devil. And <coughs> Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly than the devil is the thief who's come to destroy and to kill in Jesus' name. And he's not mm -hmm. going to touch any one of us. Amen. In the name We're going to use our weapons. That's We're going to put him in his place. Yes. And uh, there we are. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's the NIV version. My version, the New King James says, and have it more abundantly in Jesus' name. And then we looked at the full armor of God. We're not going to go through it for the second time this week. If you missed it last week, I'll be able to tell you about our YouTube channel one of these days and you can watch it <laughs> once we got it finished. In Jesus' name. Mm, amen. So today we're going to look at some of the other some of the other weapons of our warfare. We need to know that there's power in the blood. Amen. 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 Power in the blood That's of right. Jesus. When we pray, if we're under attack or if we're praying for somebody, we tell the devil, devil, the blood of Jesus against is against you. you. That's right. Make sure you always use the blood of Jesus. The Amen. Bible says that the blood of Jesus places a wall or a hedge of protection around us. And then in Ecclesiastes, I think it's chapter 10, verse 10, somewhere like that, or verse 3, I can't remember exactly. And it says there that whomsoever breaketh an edge, in the King James Version, whomsoever breaketh an edge, a serpent shall him bite. In other words, whoever breaks that edge down, you leave yourself wide open for the devil to come in and to bite you. And most times it's us yes, that let the right. edge down. Amen. In Jesus' name. So there's power in the blood. Devil, the blood of Jesus is against Amen. you. The blood of Jesus saves. The blood of Jesus heals. The blood of Jesus delivers. Hallelujah. The blood of Thank Jesus, Jesus protects. Thank in you, Jesus' Lord. name. Hallelujah. Did you catch that this morning? Yes. You need to keep Amen. it in your hearts all the Amen. time. In Jesus' mighty name. I want to get to the last weapon. There's many weapons. We haven't covered them all. But I want to get to the last one because I want to spend a bit of time on it. So just remember, you're protected by the blood you, of Jesus. Jesus. Every morning, Lee Hallelujah. and I, before I go to work, yes. Lee and I, we get together, we pray. We yeah. pray for each and every one every of you. We one. name you by name. We apply the blood of Jesus That's over it. your lives. Amen. And we just ask the Lord that that hedge That's stays right. firm. Amen. And uh, that you may protect it and you get home safely That's right. in the afternoon. When we were robbed in our house up here when we were on the front. And those uh, six armed robbers came in, yeah. two of them fell through the roof, and when we heard the, the crash and the explosion, lights, explosion, an explosion, and I went yeah. running out, luckily the burglar gate is there in the hallway, and uh, there was two getting up off the floor that had fallen through the roof, and I screamed at them, what do you want, get out in the name of Jesus, and I kept on screaming at them, Jesus is going to get you, and they just fled, the whole lot of them. Fled. They left their bullets behind, they left their knives behind, just about destroyed the house. But yeah. anyway, the blood of Jesus saved us that night. That's right. <laughs> the first Amen. time the blood Amen. of Jesus Amen. Has saved Hallelujah, us. Jesus. Amen. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Another one of your weapons of warfare is forgiveness. Yeah. You don't think about it. That's right. When you're under attack, you've got to think about it. Am I walking in forgiveness? Has somebody offended me? Do yeah. I need to forgive them? That's right. And, uh, okay, we know that the shedding of blood, the shedding of Jesus' blood, has given us forgiveness of our sins. But we need to forgive others their sins as well. The Bible tells us that if we don't forgive, how can our Heavenly Father, who's in heaven, forgive us? Right. And it's the blood of Jesus that sets us free from the law. It's the blood of Jesus that sets us free from the attack of the devil. It's the blood of Jesus that brings us forgiveness and eternal life. And we need to apply that shed blood. We need to believe in it. The shed blood of Jesus uh, uh, um, uh, ratifies 
the covenant right. that we have with our God and our Father in heaven in Jesus' name. And we thank him for that. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This was a picture the kids took of me just after I finished supper. <laughs> You're only horsing around. I was. <laughs> well, I got the bite. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and they reined me in. Let's turn our Bibles to James chapter 3. This is a very important weapon that we need to look at today. And I want to just spend a little bit of time here. I preached about it before. You probably heard other preachers preaching about it. But we need to look at it from time to time. James chapter 3 verse 1, it says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So I have to be strict on what I preach to you. Lee will tell you how I am. I'm like this. One of your other preachers, when somebody comes with a prophetic word, or when somebody speaks to me anything, I check it out with the scriptures. It must be in line with the word. Because us as teachers, as prophets, as, uh, as preachers, we will face a stricter judgment because what of what we're feeding you. If we feed you tripe, if we don't feed you a balanced gospel, we're going to have to answer for it. So it says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we receive a stricter ju judgment. Verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. Sure. Able also to bridle the whole body. Now we all make mistakes mm -hmm. with the words we use, mm -hmm. the things we say, but we need to grow in this area. That's right. We need to start getting our words right. We That's need to right. start thinking about what we're saying. Amen. And we need to grow. And when we mess up, we've got to get up, brush the dust off our feet. Just repent, which means have a change of mind, walk in the opposite direction, and walk on. Verse 3. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they shall obey us, and we turn the whole body. Mm -hmm. Just this little, I don't know if any of you have done the horse riding, but it's, it's not very long. It sticks out here, out the other side, and the reins are attached to it. And when you sat on the horse, if you wanted to turn right, you just gently pull it on the rein this way, and the horse turns... And now the horse is a big thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got a big body. And just this little bit steers that horse along the course that you want it to take for you. And verse 4 it says, Look also yeah. at ships, right. although they are large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires wherever the pilot desires let's look at the next slide now I want to tell you this is no exaggeration I was in the Navy I worked on ships I was a fitter and uh, especially those big aircraft carriers it's like this you've got this huge ship and right at the back you've got this tiny little rudder we used to have to, have to work on these sometimes we used to have to strip them and refurbish them and put grease on and all the rest of it. But the point that I'm trying to make here and what the word is saying is that this little thing here will steer this whole ship through the course mm -hmm. of its journey. And the anal analogy that James is giving us here is with our lives. He says in verse 5, Even so the tongue is a little member it's a little member of your body and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Let's go to that just now. Let's stay here for a minute. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. The things, the thing that has more, most activity in your life apart from your mind mm -hmm. is your tongue. Yeah. And sometimes that tongue can go like a machine gun. Big tongue. You ever know Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and the ana analogy is with regard to the tongue being like a rudder and our tongue is steering the course of our life. If you're going in the wrong direction, you need to start changing what your tongue is saying to go in another direction. 
It's simple. It's a spiritual law of God. You steer the course of your life by the words that you speak. And the best words to speak are the words of God. The promises of God over your life. They may not seem to be happening. It might not seem to be appearing the way you want it to be. It might not seem to be going the way you want to go. But you just got to keep on persevering That's right. in changing things. Write things down. Write scriptures down that apply to where you want to go. That apply to your situation that you want to get out of. And start talking those things. Yes. We're going to understand more about that just now. And it said there at the end of verse 5, See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Well, when we were up on the plot before we got robbed, <laughs> everything seemed to happen <laughs> within a few months before we left there. We had that massive fire. Oh, yeah. And it came so close to burning the house down. I mean, they had me emptying the garage out, moving the backies. And uh, pulling everything out, pulling everything out to, yeah. we had to get that stuff yeah. out of the flat because the uh, fireman reckoned that the next thing was the house was going to go up. And it all started, they reckon, we got our other theories, yes. but they reckon somebody flicked the uh, cigarette butts over the wall into the fog at the back there, which was always overgrown. And it caused such a massive yeah. fire. I should have put pictures up here of that. Yeah, you should have, yeah. But, um, so it's just a little, little spark that can make a big fire. Now think about this. Sometimes your tongue can just say a little spark and it can cause a big fire, especially with the family. <laughs> yeah. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> or am I wrong? You can say the wrong thing accidentally without, or you, you might be just frustrated and you just say something. Comes. Yeah, don't cop or something like that, <laughs> and that's it, you're in trouble. See how great a forest a little fire can kindles. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire. Mm -hmm. Listen to what God is saying. Your tongue is a fire, a yeah. world of iniquity. Think about it, the next time you're not in the spirit. <laughs> The next time you're angry and it all comes out, blah, blah, blah. It comes out like a fountain. A tongue is a fire in a world of iniquity. You must listen to what it says. The tongue is so set. And you know what the problem is? When you release something from your tongue, when you release it, you can't take it back. That's right. It's already gone out. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. Sometimes we wish, we wish our, our tongue was underneath our foot. Yeah. <laughs> but it's right there, where everybody can hear, where a lot of people can see, and with, with it come words that defile the whole body. And set on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Is this recording, Frank? Where's my wood? Where's my man? Is it recording? It defiles the whole body and set, uh, sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. So you must think about this nicely. The devil, he wants to trip you up with your words. He wants you to be talking negative words. He wants you to be talking fear, words of fear. He doesn't want you talking any faith. He doesn't want you to change your life. And it's, a, it's set on fire by hell, by the, the, the fiery darts that he shoots at your mind, yeah. by the horrible flesh feelings that he stirs up within you, and then all of a sudden, boom, it's coming out. And it says here, it sets on fire the course of nature. The course of nature. The words you speak can change nature. The words you speak can change nature. I've seen my wife... When a storm has been approaching and she's told the storm to go around the other side and it's been very obedient. And it's gone around the other side. You can change nature with your tongue. We don't understand it sometimes, but that's the way God's created it. And I, I want to explain this to you as well. Just understand this. You will never understand God. God's ways are not our ways. His mind is not our mind. But he reveals things to us. 
And don't try and work God out. And don't try and think you know better. He tells you how to live your life. Don't think you know a better way. That's right. Amen. He tells you how to forgive. Don't think you know you don't have to forgive. He tells you you must forgive all men. He teaches us that we must love God and love man. And we must do that. Don't think you don't have to. You have to. You have to walk in forgiveness. And he tells you, he explains everything in here. How to treat your wife, how to treat your husband, how to build a family life, how to build a marriage, how to walk as a Christian, how to put off the old man and how to put on the new man. He even talks to you about your finances. He teaches you and tells you how to tithe. It's in here. It tells you how to tithe. It tells you the, 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 the purpose of tithing, the whole reason of tithing. Tithing isn't to make the pastor rich. But one thing tithing does do is stops the pastor from getting poor when he's got to pay all the church's bills. He tells you to bring your tithe to the altar. Very few people do that, but it's what he wants. Yes. That's how he says to do it. That's if, right. you're, if, you're, if there's something in your life that you're struggling with and you don't understand why you're struggling with it, it's probably because you're not doing it God's way. God's got his reasons. I don't know why God said a man and a woman mustn't sleep together before they get married. If they're in love, they're going to get married. And I've had it said to me by couples that I've married, married that they're already living together. Well, I can't see any harm in it, Pastor. We're getting married anyway. And I usually say to them, listen, I can't see any harm in it for, apart from spiritual reasons That's right. that I can give you out of the Bible. I don't know why God says that. God tells us not to tell lies. Yes. We must lie. Even an exaggeration is a lie. Absolutely. We've got to keep our mouths clean. I'm going to say that to you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Now we know we've got still wild lions and wild animals around, but most of them, a lot of them, out of that particular kind, have been tamed by man. Animals have been put under the subjection of man. Adam was told to go and subdue them all. And that's exactly what happened. But the one thing that has not been tamed, and some of these things, grizzly bears when you think about it, some of these wild animals that have been tamed, the one thing that has not been tamed... Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Nothing compared to those animals. It says in verse 8, but no man can tame the tongue. Put your hand up and say, I've tried, Pastor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no man can tame the tongue. I fail every day. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Mm -hmm. Just think of the words you're saying the next time you tell your husband or your wife, I, I hate you. Sure. I should have divorced you. Mm -hmm. Can't stand you. Mm -hmm. You know what you're saying. Think about what you're saying. Yeah, you know what? Good. We can speak plenty of words about other people. But do we care about the words we're speaking over ourselves? Mm. Do we think about the words we're speaking over ourselves? Mm. But no man can tame the tongue. But the good news is God can. Philippians chapter 1, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, says, I can do all things through Christ Amen. who strengthens me. Amen. Through Christ who strengthens me. Use a little bit of theology. That word Christ means anointed one and his anointing. So, I can do all things through the anointed one and his anointing, which is on me. I can do all things through that. So I can tame my tongue. I can't do it in my own strength. Mm -hmm. I can't do it in my own natural man. Mm -hmm. But I can do it through God. That's right. And we need to learn to do it. We need to practice doing it until we got it. And the reason we need to tame the tongue is because it's an unruly evil, verse 8, and it's full of deadly poison. With it, verse 9, we bless our God and our Father, and with it we curse men. Yeah. Who have been made in the similitude of God. The other day I was going down the P91 in the taxi. Trying to come down through inside the yellow line. And trying to cut it in front of me at the robot. Hmm. And. Resting. I don't have to say anymore. Yeah. And I can still see his face when he stared at me full of anger. And the Bible here says he's made in the similitude of God. 
I really couldn't believe that. Mm. But it is a fact. We're all made in the image of God. That's right. Verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. And my brethren, these things ought not to be so. These things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Yeah. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness and in wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, don't boast and lie against the truth. The wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, sensual, this wisdom does not descend from above. In other words, the self-seeking and the boasting and the lying. Mm -hmm. They don't descend from above. They're That's earthly, they're sensual, and he says they're demonic. Mm -hmm. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and everything evil is there as well. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, mm -hmm. then willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, no partiality, and no hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Just back up with me. Let's just go back up to verse 8. No, let's go back up to verse 4. It says, Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. And I said to you, I said to you, that that's an a, a analogy of our lives with our tongues. Our tongue is the same as the rudder of a ship, and it steers the course of your life. Now in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, you've heard me quote this to you plenty of times, and it says there, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can speak death over yourself, you can speak life over somebody else, or you can speak death and life even over your own self. Yep. Your words have value, power, and authority. Yes, amen. You can have what you say, right. or you can say what you have. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Yeah. You can have what you say, or you can say what you have. You can stay where you are, or you can increase. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. When me and I first started the ministry, we, we used to go and visit people with life-threatening diseases in hospitals, in their homes, all over the place. And one thing I found out was of great value. When a person was struggling with cancer or something like that, and you walk in and you can see that they're really struggling, I always used to tell them, gee, man, you look so much better than you did yesterday. And when you speak like that to people, they start to feel better. They really do. Unless they're going to argue about it and say, I feel terrible. But most times, you can get them to start talking life over themselves. It says here, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You'll eat the fruit of what you say. You're going to eat the fruit of your words. If you speak death over yourself, you're going to eat death. If you speak life over yourself, you're going to eat life. You need to start talking prosperity yes. and not That's lack. Right. Yes. Maybe you're walking in lack. Yeah. Maybe you're not prospering the way you should do. Yes. Or maybe you're not confessing it and speaking those words. Maybe, maybe you're not thanking the Lord. Lord, I thank you. You are my shepherd and I shall yeah. not lack yes, in Lord. Jesus' name. Father God, I thank you that you supply all my needs right. according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. When we put our offering in the, here this morning, Lee and myself, the pray, prayer we often pray is, Lord, I thank you. We give out of our need because we know yes. you take care right. of our Amen. every need. Amen. In Jesus' Amen. name. So you need to, you're going to eat the fruit of what you speak. The fruit of what you speak. In Jesus' name. If I'm not feeling too good, if I'm feeling a bit unwell, I don't like to talk too much about it to okay. other people. I try to keep it to myself and I just keep on confessing healing, health, 
abundance in Jesus' name. We confess it over you every morning. We say, Father God, I thank you that Sean and Joanne, and we go through the whole lot of you. We thank you that prospering on all Amen. things. We thank you, Lord, today they will have hearts of peace. I thank you for breakthrough and deliverance yes. in their lives. Amen. I thank you, Lord, that substance abuse will not have any hold on their lives right. anymore. In, in Jesus', Jesus name. name, I thank you, Lord, that lack will not control their lives That's anymore right. because you are their provider in Jesus' name. And your word says that you delight in the prosperity of your servants. That's right. Amen. Don't think that God right. doesn't delight in your prosperity. Don't think that it's more Christian or more religious or more spiritual. Uh -huh. I hate religion. I'm not a religious person. I believe in relationship. Not That's religion. right. Amen. But let me tell you this. Don't think that God doesn't want you to prosper in all things. The he Bible's does. full of it. And the most important is that God delights yes. in your prosperity. prosperity. Yes. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 when we're on the subject of we will eat the fruit of our words. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 down to verse 12. Two Corinthians chapter 4 verse 12 says, So then death is working in us, but life is in you. Death is working in you, but life, sorry, death is working in us, but life is in you. Verse 13, and since we have the same spirit of faith, faith that calls those things that be not, read it in Romans chapter 4, the, the, the faith of Abraham, faith that calls those things that be not just as though they are. Mm -hmm. Abraham did not waver or was shaken in unbelief, but he was firmly convinced Firmly persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to do. It should be if God said it, I have it, and that settles it. Doesn't matter what the circumstances look like. Circumstances are subject to change. We do not walk by faith. Sorry, we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Back up to chapter 4, verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed... And therefore, mm -hmm. I spoke. We also believe, and therefore, we speak. But just look at verse 12. We just read it. So then death is working in us, but life in you. We've got the life of Christ in us. We've got the power of Jesus in us. We've got his blood over us. We've been washed in his blood. All things have passed away. Behold, everything has become That's new. Right. But death is still working in us. And do you know what keeps death working in us? Our words. Read it in context. So then death is working in us, but life is in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke. I will not speak death words. I will only speak life That's words. Right, I will not speak lack words. I will only speak prosperity That's words. Right. Abundant words. And what is wrong with it is that the flesh hates it because when we speak faith against the circumstances, mm -hmm. it looks like we're lying. That's right. That's why people outside of the church, outside of the born again church, the faith movement, they don't understand us. Mm. When we're sick and we got a snotty nose and we're feeling like throwing up and we confess and still that we're healed. They don't understand that. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 12, I think it is, that the natural man, the natural man, the natural man is a man who's devoid of the Spirit of God. The natural man does not understand the things of the, of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he understand them because they're spiritually discerned. You see, to understand this, you have to have the Spirit of God. You have to be born again. Jesus must be in your life. Jesus must be in your heart. But we're learning. We're under construction. We're growing in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. And he says that death is working in us. And I can tell you it's by our words. We speak death over our words. We speak death over our situations. We speak death over opportunities that present themselves to us instead of speaking life. If we have the spirit of faith, we will call those things that be not <laughs> as though they are. Yes. Just be careful. Maybe I must preach to you another day about faith, foolishness, and presumption. You must be careful of going down the road of foolishness and presumption. 
You've got to make sure that what you're going to speak, those light words, line up with the word of God in Jesus' name. And he wants you to prosper. Amen. He wants you to prosper. That's right. Say, God wants me to prosper. God wants me to prosper. You better believe yes. it. If you don't Amen. believe it and you don't confess it, Amen. it ain't going to happen. Amen. You're not going to get it. You are not going to get it. Now, down in verse 8 it's of uh, James chapter 3, it said there, But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. So we need to choose the right words. We need, and do you know that's so important to God? That's so important to God. The words you use are, should be words of faith. Because you see, you've got to understand something. I heard the one guy say one day when I said this, that your faith activates God. It gets God activated. And he said, no, 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 no. That's not going to jump. God loves us and we're his children. We can speak to him anyway. And I said to him, no, 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 you've got to understand this. The Bible says that God is spirit. He's not flesh. He's spirit. He experienced flesh when he came in the form of Jesus. And as a man went to the cross and was in every way tempted just as we are. But the point is this. God is spirit. And God is faith. He is faith. He calls those things to be not just as though they are. He said, let there be light, and there was light. That's right. He created everything by speaking the word of faith. That's the only language that God really understands. Because he's faith. He created it. And we are his children. So, if my dad, my dad was an Englishman, and that's why I'm English. Your dad might have been an Afrikaans chap. And that's why you're Afrikaans. Or it may be a Portuguese guy. And that's why you're Portuguese. Did you understand that, Nate? Yep. <laughs> and that's why you're Portuguese. And it's the same with God. God is spirit. And we've got God's spirit in us. We are also spirit. We have a soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And we live in a body. So we're created in spirit in the image of God. And he is a faith God. So we are faith children. God expects us to be doing faith exploits. Now catch this. Mm -hmm. So the words you speak are very important and they're important to God. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36, this is what Jesus said. He said, but I say to you that for every idle word, say idle. idle. For every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. Mm. Every idle word, men may speak. Not necessarily will speak, but may speak. And if we don't deal with it, if we don't get those words reversed, we're going to have to give an account for it. Yes. Now let me have a look at this word idle. But I say to you that for every idle word, do you know that that Greek word for idle there means this, it means useless. So for every useless word you speak, it means idle, lazy word. Every lazy word, that means negative, every negative word, you can look it up. That's the three main meanings of the word idle, useless, idle, and negative. So for every useless word you speak, every idle word you speak, and every negative word you speak, you will have to give an account for in the judgment, unless you get rid of it with the blood of Jesus, you repent from it, and you start changing those words. When I say things, me and myself, we correct in ourselves all the time. I'll say something and she'll say, ah, you shouldn't have said that. That's good. What are you saying there? And then I'll, I'll catch it and I understand. And then I've got to replace it immediately with a word of faith. If I say, oh, I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent this month. I don't know how I'm going to pay the electricity this month. And she'll and she, she correct me and tell me. And I'll say, yes, my God will supply all my needs. Amen. To my riches Amen. And glory, his riches and glory. By Christ Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that rent will be paid. Yes. I thank you, Lord, every bill will be paid. I trust. thank you, Father, yeah. money will come into yes. us we call in, Jesus in. in Jesus' name to pay all these bills. Amen. In Jesus' name, because you, you are our shepherd, and it's your desire that we should lack nothing. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord. We are not going under. We are going over. Amen. In Jesus' Amen. name. Do you believe it this morning? Yes. Amen. You better believe it. You don't say yes. it. You believe it. You need to believe it. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. 
in Jesus' mighty name. So that's the truth of the matter. Let us remember, it's an ugly picture, I don't know if you can see it here, but it's like demons on the tongue and all the rest of it. Let us remember that our tongue holds blessing and curses. So let's watch our words. Speak words of blessing. That next door neighbor who drove, drove you crazy yesterday in the garden, doing whatever they were doing. Our neighbors had a big party last week. And, uh, but we choose to bless them. Lord, bless them. Let them have a nice time. They don't get drunk and get killed on the way home. Let them have a good time. Lord. Let blessing and cursing. Uh, blessing come out of your tongue and not curses. That's right. Watch our words. We need to be careful. So careful about our words. Mm. In Jesus' name, your words are such a powerful spiritual weapon because the devil wants you to get your words lined up with what he wants, with his will for your life. That's what he wants. God has given you all this word here, given you everything in here for your words to line up with what his will is for your life, what he wants for your life. And because of this here, this flesh, this natural man, the tendency is for us to get into agreement with the one that we've been dancing with and having fellowship most of our lives right up to the point that we got born again. That's right, amen. But now you're a new creation. Yes. I told you this. So those old things must be passed away. We must now step out of that realm of negativity, of fear, and of unbelief and walk into the realm of faith. And a loving Heavenly Father that wants the best for you, and He does not force His way on you. God does not force His way on anybody. He doesn't. He's a gentleman, if you want to use that term. But you can't act really. He doesn't even describe it. But the thing is with God, He gives you the choice. He says, I put before you life and death, blessing and cursing, and then he gives you the best advice you'll ever get. Choose life. Look at somebody and say, I'm a friend of God. Saying you can't do anything about it.